Okay. All right. I'm going to get started here. Did it, does anyone um, you know this picture? Does this make you laugh? Um, yeah. So ridiculous, right? What about this one? Does anyone have a favorite orange? <laughs> Who cares, right? Why would you want to solve that problem? So on that note. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Ramsey Musalam, and I teach high school chemistry at Sacred Heart Cathedral in San Francisco. If you teach at Sacred Heart, raise your hand. Woo! All right. Um, so it's after lunch. It's the end of the day. So um, I'm going to try and be uh, go through this slowly. And really, what I just am r- really passionate about is just sharing things I like to do as a teacher. I love teaching. I love geeking out about teaching. Um, and I love sharing that with you guys. And I'm a chemistry teacher, so I'm going to do a simulation with you today, and it's going to be a chemistry one, because that's all I really know anything about. Um, but I encourage you guys to think about the structure that I'm going to share and um, reflect on that. So this link is a link to the, a PDF of the slides, and I put them together in a very structured way. Um, I feel like with an hour-long presentation at tech conferences like this, you always see, and I, I fall guilty to this myself too, the presenter trying to jump back and forth between sharing tools and doing how-tos and then trying to talk about pedagogy. Right? And going back and forth, and you just end up getting stuck and lost and not know what to do. And at the end of the day, you're not going to learn any tools in an hour. You've got to go home and practice all of those. So I'm trying to bridge that gap here with the way that I put this together. So when you open it, what you're going to see is a screenshot of each slide, okay? And to the right of that, you see the the notes. And in the notes, I put the tools and a description of the tools there for you. So you'll have a flow of every every single thing I do up here. And anything I talk about, I'm going to really try and focus on pedagogy. And I know that might be hard to swallow because we want easy answers, but the technology will definitely never provide that. So, um, you, but you have all the tools. So I'll, I'll pull this back up, but I just wanted to show you the way it's lined up. So here's the way it would look without giving away too much of my That's everything I'm going to say. All right. Um, so you see on the right-hand side, there will be a link to the tool. Okay, or whatever I'm talking about. So, and at the very first slide, you have all my contact information there. So, there's a link to my blog, um, and my email, my phone number. Text me if you have a question. I don't care. And Twitter. Cheap way to get more Twitter followers. Um, so, there they are. I'll keep that up for a sec. You can take a picture of it, and I'll come back to it. Okay. So, um, it's a tech conference, so no better way to start off a technology uh, workshop with a little clip from The Office. Do you guys watch The Office? It's amazing, right? So, a little montage of Michael Scott moments for you. Uh, Still lame. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you, Ryan, for that wonderful introduction. Okay. Um... Today we're going to be talking about PowerPoint. PowerPoint, PowerPoint, PowerPoint. And we are in. We are going to register. You hit register. Updates are ready. I should update. Um, Estimated time 12 minutes, so this should take about 5 or 10 minutes. (laughs) This is the first time you've opened PowerPoint. Okay, honestly. It is unlikely that I was going to figure this out anyway. I will go first. When I discovered YouTube, I didn't work for five days. I did nothing. I viewed Cookie Monster sings Chocolate Rain about a thousand times. What was the dilemma? To tell you or not. And I'm glad I did. I feel very, very good. Wikipedia is the best thing ever. Anyone in the world can write anything they want about any subject. So you know you are getting the best possible information. 
<laughs> it's true though, right? And all the citations are in APA at the bottom of Wikipedia, which is really easy when you're doing a research project for your graduate school program. You didn't hear me say that. All right, so um, this little picture of me taken from my classroom. Um, like I said, I teach high school chemistry, and I've been teaching chemistry for, uh, that's, that's, that's real by the way, took some methane bubbles to the head. Um, I've te been teaching high school chemistry for 12 years, and I, I I think it's safe to say for the first eight of them, I was uh, thought I was doing a good job at it, and I was really doing a crappy job at it. Um, the 1% AP test pass rate was enough to tell me that I was doing a pretty crappy job at it. Um, but I felt like I was doing a really good job at it because people really wanted to be in my class. They really liked the class. Um, but what do you think I was just doing? Blowing stuff up, right? That's all, I was just a magic show. So here's a little montage of that. Just look at Gummy, focus on Gummy. Ah! Look at him, look at him shaking around in there. Ah! <laughs> Gummy! <laughs> Ridiculous, right? So, um, then the 2005, 2006, eight came, and we had Google Docs. And the best thing on Google Docs is Google Forms. Unbelievable, right? Unbelievable um, until you start at using the Google Form the right way, which is to ask kids what they're learning, and then you have the guts to make that anonymous too which was stupid because it totally ruined my sense of self-confidence for like three years. Um, but this is, this, this is word for word taken from it. I still don't have a clue how to balance a chemical reaction, but I loved watching you blow stuff up. <laughs> so, and there's nothing more to boost, like, in class, that love makes you feel like they love your class. This thing makes me, tells me that they're not learning much. All right? Now, I'm kind of giving myself a hard time. Obviously, I was trying to like, be the best teacher I could be. But um, this was definitely true. There was this tension between what it means to learn how to be a teacher versus thinking that teaching is entertaining and that kind of thing. So that was kind of the beginning of my journey that I went on. Um, and then I started going to graduate school to learn more about teaching. So what is this up here? Bloom's Taxonomy, right? I love Bloom's Taxonomy. I would marry Bloom's Taxonomy if I wasn't already married, right? It's amazing because it clearly tells me about the Common Core. It clearly tells me about the Next Gen Science Standard. It clearly tells me all the things that I want my students to be able to do. And then you learn about Vygotsky and the Zone of Proximal Development, all that. And it's I, what I felt I needed to do was take my kids from the bottom and take them up to the top. And because I had a smart board in my classroom, why didn't I just record me doing this lower level stuff and give it to him for homework so then I had all this time in class to take him up here through the supply piece. And that was something that I started doing. I, thought, I felt like this was my route out. And you probably heard about this idea of the flip classroom and you probably get frustrated because you don't know what the heck it is and all that kind of stuff. So essentially what I was doing was I was just recording myself. They would watch it at home and they'd come into class and I felt like this was the transition. This was going to change my whole classroom. Okay? And then I started to reflect on really what that was like on the student end. So what movie is this from? Barry Spieler, right? So I was like, all right, I'm going to take a boring lecture. In this case, it's voodoo economics. I was going to take a boring lecture on like something nerdy like the Henderson-Hasselbeck equation or whatever that is, right? And I was going to put it in the kid's device. But it's still a boring video in the kid's device. Even though they're getting it at home, they're still getting the same boring content. And I was wondering why they weren't more motivated to learn and why the, cr the thing that I thought was going to free up class time, all of this, ended up being a study hall. 
I ended up having like a whole 90 minutes of kids just doing problems and doing homework for other classes. So I didn't structure it that well. You know, I'm being hard on it, but that was my experience. All right, so there had to be, I thought this was good technology though. Like it was screencasting and, and all that. It's really powerful technology. So there must have been, there must be something about this. So at the same time, I had gotten married and my wife and I on our honeymoon um, watched Lost on the plane there the whole way. Anybody watch Lost? Out there? Big fans of Lost? I love Lost. Okay? And I fell in love with this show. I got really obsessed with it. I like, would read the Lost blogs. I'd read the spoilers. You know, I was obsessed with it. You know, who is Desmond? What's going on? So, I just started thinking about it. And I saw this cool TED talk by J.J. Um, Abrams. Is a founder of Lost, and I want to play you a piece from it, because it was literally at this moment when I was watching this talk that a little light bulb went off in my head about how I might actually make the shift from, uh, we'll call it pseudo-teaching, to actual teaching. Look at, at stories, you think, well, what are stories but mystery boxes? There's a fundamental question. In TV, the first act is called the teaser. It's literally the teaser. It's the big question. So you're drawn into it. And then, of course, there's another question, and it goes on and on and on. I mean, look at, like, Star Wars. You've got the droids. They meet the mysterious woman. Who's that? We don't know. Mystery box, you know. Then you meet Luke Skywalker. He gets the droid. You see the holographic image. You learn, oh, it's a message. You know, she wants to, you know, find Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's her only hope. But who the hell is Obi-Wan Kenobi? Mystery box. So then you go, and he meets Ben Kenobi. Ben Kenobi's uncle is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Holy shit, you know. So it keeps us. <laughs> Have you guys not seen that? It's huge. Anyway, uh, so so there's this thing with uh, with with mystery boxes that I, I I started feeling like compelled. Then there's a the thing of like mystery in terms of of imagination. The in, 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 uh, the withholding of information. You know, um, doing that intentionally is much more uh, engaging, whether it's like the shark in Jaws. If Spielberg's you know, mechanical shark Bruce had worked, it would not have been remotely as scary. You would have seen it too much. In Alien, they never really show the alien terrifying. Um, even in a movie like, uh, you know, like a romantic, romantic comedy, The Graduate, they're having that date, remember, and they're in the car, and, and, and it's loud, and so they put the top up, and they're in there. You don't hear anything they're saying. You, you can't hear a word, but it's the most romantic date ever, and you love it because you don't hear it. So to me, there's that. And then uh, finally, the, there's this idea and stretching the, the sort of um, paradigm a little bit, but the idea of the mystery box, meaning what you think you're getting, then what you're really getting. Um, and it's true in, in, in so many movies and stories. I mean, you look at E.T., for example. E.T. is this, you know, unbelievable movie about what? It's about an alien who meets a kid, right? Well, it's not. E.T. is about divorce. E.T. is about a, a heartbroken, divorced, crippled family, and ultimately this kid who, who can't find his way. Die Hard, right? Crazy, great, fun, action-adventure movie in a building. It's about a guy who's on the verge of divorce. He's, like, showing up to L.A., tail between his legs. There are great scenes, maybe not the most amazing dramatic scenes in the history of time, but pretty great scenes. There's a half an hour of investment in character before you get to the stuff that you're, you know, expecting. When you look at a movie like Jaws, the, the scene that you expect, we have the screen, these are the kind of, you know, scenes that you remember and expect from Jaws. And she's being eaten. There's a shark. The thing about Jaws is it's really about a guy who is sort of dealing with his place in the world, with his masculinity, with his family, how he's going to, you know, make it work in this new town. So I, it just that idea when he said the intentional withholding of information, doing that intentionally, like that just started to really ring in my head. And I was like, there got, there's got to be something deeper pedagogically between the way, the reason I like this show so much and my students being totally uninvested in my class. Like there's got to be some connection. So, so I started to pay close attention to other things that I really liked. So my favorite movie was this movie. What movie is this? This is my favorite movie of all time obsessed with the movie. So um, I'm going to show you three brief little clips of my three favorite movies um, and we're going to try and pull out similarities between those real quick. So here's a clip from the very beginning of Good Will Hunting. By the way, if you guys have the tools you see on the side, there should be something that says my tool, like this is from my video database and all of my clips, hundreds of them are on my blog in my Google Drive and you have access to all these, so all these are yours. Also, um, if you notice, these are playing straight off my slide. These are MP4s, so, but I've gotten them from YouTube. So I'm using an app called KeepVid, which I'm sure people use a lot, to get the MP4s. Because I don't want to depend on the internet in front of you guys. I'd look like an idiot if, if it failed. Same thing with my students, because our school's internet is weak sometimes. No offense. So, um, so I'm going to play a clip from the beginning of this.
Sorry. What do you do? Sorry. That's people's work. You can't repeat it here. Okay, in the middle of Goodwill Hunting? Doing off in right? Do you think I know the first thing about how hard your life has been? How you feel? Who you are? Because I read all of the twist. Does that encapsulate you? And the end. Sean, if the professor calls about that job, just tell him, sorry. I had to go see about a girl. Well. Son of a bitch. He stole my life. Alright, next favorite movie. What is it? Star Wars. Middle of Star Wars. to Star Wars. Alright, and the greatest movie of all time. We don't even need to say what movie this is, okay? Because it's got Elizabeth Shue in it, which is my crush for like 10 years growing up, right? So, and we'll stop at the Elizabeth Shue scene and just take it in, okay? So, this is, um, this is Karate Kid, right? This is the best example, okay? Beginning of Karate Kid. You couldn't leave well enough alone. Could you, little twerk? No, you had to push it. Well, now you're gonna pay. Where are you going, sweetheart? How about a front kick, Johnny? Get him out. Hey, leave him alone, man. He's had enough. Shut up, mommy. Look at him, Scott. You can't even stand up. No one. That don't mean squat. Johnny, leave him alone, man. He's had enough. I'm on the side, but he's had enough, man. What is wrong with you, Johnny? The enemy deserves no mercy. Right, right, right. You're crazy, man. Man, what if we let our students struggle that much before we helped them out? In the middle. Show me Thunder Floor. Thunder Floor. Thunder Floor. And the triumphant ending. Just take it in. I think what I love about that so much too is that Miyagi never taught him that move. That he got that, he assimilated that out of all the little pieces that he taught him. He was able to pull that off. Um, so I think there's a lot of things, w if we now go back to the Bloom's model, if we take a look at this and now we try and relate it back to the classroom, all of these stories had three things in common. There was this initial exploration. Daniel was trying to learn karate at the beginning of that movie. Okay? Luke was trying to figure out what was going on at the beginning of Star Wars. Okay? Um, Hoosiers is another great example of this. Right? The ending of Hoosiers, if anyone's seen it, is not what 
what the coach planned to do, but all the skills that the coach used to get him there allowed them to create their own reality and extend it out. Um, so there's this moment of exploration. Notice, it's a flip on Bloom's taxonomy. We're starting at the top of Bloom's. We're not starting at the bottom. Okay? And it's kind of slow to get down to the bottom. It, it was hard for... If Miyagi saw him beat up Johnny, he probably wouldn't have jumped over that fence and helped him. Right? He probably wouldn't have. And that's, if, if he was able to construct the knowledge on his own, that's a whole different ballgame. Um, and then there was this moment, I'll call it the flip, because every time the teacher came in, notice, the teacher came in in the second clip. There was never the teacher in the beginning. Yoda, Robin Williams, everything is always in the middle of the, or towards the end of the movie. Um, and it was always kind of this one-on-one -on -one thing, which is why I'm calling it the flip, because if we're doing it in the classroom, it's one-on-30. Um, but notice it's happening later. It's delayed. Okay? Um, and then there was this walk back up Blooms, where the creation happened. So whether it was Ralph Macchio with this new move, or... Um, uh, Jimmy Chetwood shooting the jumper from the top of the key when it was a whole different plan of attack, or Luke totally creating his own reality in terms of what a Jedi meant to beat him. All these stories involve kind of this walk around Blooms. So what I, what I decided I was going to do was try and intentionally lesson plan this way. Just take them on a walk around Blooms. And that's the way I was going to think about it in my head. Notice, flip becomes a technique in the context of a pedagogy now. It's not a pedagogy in and of itself. It is just direct instruction if that's all that's happening. There's no difference between giving a kid a video to watch at home other than the fact that they can rewind it. But that doesn't mean that they're invested in it. So it's a different ballgame. Um, so we're going to go through a quick little simulation right now so you guys can get an idea of a, a quick way this might have played out in my classroom. I'm going to ask you to uh, do that awkward thing where you might talk to some people next to you at a conference that you don't even know. So, um, so I'm going to show you a video clip right now that many of you have seen. And um, notice at the bottom I'm putting the level of blooms here. So we're starting with evaluate and analyze. So we're starting at the top of blooms. And I just want you to, to watch this and tell me what you notice. You've all seen this clip before. I want you to tell me what you notice. Release. With cheers from his crew and tears from his mom, Daredevil Felix Baumgartner began his improbable journey to the edge of space. Capsule check, are you ready? Yes, sir, go ahead. For two and a half hours, the 43-year-old Austrian skydiver floated to an astounding 24 miles up, 128,000 feet above the New Mexico yes, desert, where he opened his capsule, hung his feet out the door, was reminded to unfasten his seatbelt, seat belt. saluted, and he just jumped right into the record books. He plummeted at an inconceivable 833 miles per hour. So fast, the only way to... <laughs> it's crazy. So, could you guys turn it to the person next to you and tell me what you noticed? Tell them what you noticed. Come back together. Anybody want to share something that they noticed? Yes. Um, I noticed that I probably wouldn't have watched so clearly unless I watched this one. Yeah. Cool. So what we did, how we prompt kids for things. I also, this, I trimmed this. I just showed you the piece I wanted to show you. So again, the, the flow, the tech flow was YouTube, boom, keep vid. MP4, QuickTime, Trim, Keynote. 
That was the flow. Also, if, if anybody, you might not know this, this is a really cool hack. If you, I'm actually just going to show you right now, why not? Who cares, right? It's after lunch, you guys are like zoned out anyway. <laughs> All right. So um, if you go to YouTube and you just go to any YouTube video, like, like what's a hilarious YouTube video like NFL bad lip reading? Have you guys seen this? It's like the most, I want cake now. <laughs> it's hilarious, right? So um, if you, if you right click on any YouTube video, right on it, if you right click on it, you get these options. And a lot of people don't know about this. But one of the options is copy video URL at current time. So you, you play the video URL to exactly where you want it to be, right click, and then if you give kids that URL, it'll start the video right where you right clicked on. So that's legit, right? Um, the other little trick about this too is this thing that says pop out. If I click this, we're taking a little sidetrack right now, but whatever. You get a pop up, you get this pop out video. There's a playback error or whatever. But if you copy the pop out URL and you open it up in a new window, the video opens up in full screen. Right? So here, here's how I use this. If I send kids a video to watch that just, hey, here's something interesting, I send them the pop-out URL. So it opens up in full screen when they watch it. Also, if you're in a one-to-one -one environment and you push out the pop-out URL to groups and you say, watch this video and tell me what you think, they're going to get it in full screen right away. And that, with no, no, no garbage on the side. So, little trick. I don't know how we ended up talking about that, but... Okay, so, yeah, so what I did was um, on a Mac, I took the video URL, I put it in keep vid, allowed me to download the MP4. And then I went to edit in QuickTime when I opened it up, and there's the trim option. And I just trimmed out the beginning and the end and put it back in. Okay, it, it, what, like Chris Lehman of Science Leadership Academy, you guys might have heard him before. He has an amazing quote where he talks about technology being ubiquitous in the background, something we don't want the kids to think about, that just is the way we, the, our language. You know, nothing's worse, I feel, than walking with some iPads saying, we're going to do technology today. Now, here. But it, when I do it this way, I feel like it's all about the, the thing I want you to learn about. It's not about me going to YouTube and playing a video for you. It's, a, it's just right there. And I, I like that about it because I feel like we lose a lot when we have to be a slave to the, the internet sometimes. So I, I was assuming that most of you, some of you might have caught what I wanted you to watch. And I wanted to see if you did. But I'm going to play it again for you. This time, I put it in iMovie, and I edited it a little bit to highlight something I want you to focus on. OK? Release. With cheers from his crew and tears from his mom, Daredevil Felix Baumgartner began his improbable journey to the edge of space. Capsule check, are you ready? Yes, sir, go ahead. For two and a half hours, the 43-year-old Austrian skydiver floated to a... All right, so did you see that? Okay, I'm going to play it one more time for you. Release. With cheers from his crew and tears from his mom, Daredevil Felix Baumgartner began his improbable journey to the edge of space. Capsule check. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Go ahead. For two and a half hours, the... Okay. So talk with the same person next to you, and I want you to try and explain that observation. Okay, guys, uh, bring it back together. Um, anybody want to share something they, uh, they observed in this? Yes. Yeah, the balloon was skinny and not filled with the bottom. Okay, I want to I piggyback off that word. He said filled. Can someone not use the word filled and tell me something else? Yeah. Okay. 
So you have some prior knowledge here. What's the ideal gas law equation? You know, you had to take, what's the ideal gas law equation? PV equals NRT. So you have some prior knowledge, but um, whatever. <laughs> Pretend like you don't. <laughs> um, I, wa I want to get, the, but you said filled, and I want to piggyback on that a little bit. Yeah. The balloon got bigger, the higher it went. Okay, why? Pre why? What? What? A why did the volume of the air increase? Because the external pressure decreased. Why did the external pressure decrease? Why does the pressure go down as you go higher in the atmosphere? Well, it's funny. It's hard to answer that question. And I, I have AP chemistry students who the other day came to me and said, I don't get why it's cold on the top of Mount Everest when it's closer to the sun. And you'd be, you'd be surprised how many kids have that misconception. And, you don't really, and how many kids think the balloon is actually filling? When you could say that it's 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 just the gas occupying a larger volume, perhaps there there might be some air coming in as well. But that if that was a closed system, that's, that that effect would still happen. Put a bag of chips on your lap and drive to Tahoe from Sacramento, you notice it happen. Um, look at your shampoo in the plane when you used to be able to have shampoo on the plane. Um, so I'm going to play you another clip. I want you to watch it. Okay, we're still evaluating, and now we're going to we're, look at that word apply. You have a little bit of knowledge without me even doing any direct instruction. We just had a conversation. The conversation was in response to the inquiry, though. What you thinking about that? All right, so this is from the movie called The, the Abyss. Anyone seen it? Okay, this is a freaking freaky scene, okay? So I just want you to watch it. Is this so your eyes can focus in the breathing fluid? How's that feel? There it is. If you can't see, you can't disarm the bomb, right? Okay, with this much weight, you're gonna fall like a brick. We still got about an hour, so we should get there in plenty of time. When you get down there, all you gotta do is cut one wire, drop the weights, and come on home. Okay, let's rock and roll. Crack it. Headset, headset, please. Okay. Relax now, bud. Just relax. Bud. Relax now, bud. What? Relax. Okay, watch me. Watch me. Hey, okay. doing fine. Now, don't hold your breath. Take it in. Just let yourself take it in. Take it in. That's it. Oh, man. Don't hold your breath now. Take it in. There you go. Don't hold your breath. Take it in. That's it. There you go. What? It's perfectly normal. This is normal. perfectly normal. We all breathe liquid for nine months, bud. Your body will remember. That's it. That's it. Perfectly normal. Oh my Christ, he breathed. I redid Little Geek's chip the same as Big Geek. It should take you straight there. All you have to do is hang on. So um, I'll say there are similarities between this and the last one. So I'd like you to evaluate this and I'll apply the knowledge that we talked about last time to this new scenario. So I want you to talk with each other. How is this similar, but how is it different to the last situation? And you probably have to agree on why he was doing this anyway. And to give you some prior knowledge, what he was doing was he was inhaling that liquid into his lungs. That's what was going on in that clip. Okay. Okay, uh, obviously uh, we have a longer conversation. Anybody like to share with me the similarities and differences between this one and the last one? 
somebody's some know it all is out there, not the chemistry person. Way in the back, yes. Is that Kyle? No. The the pressure's going up. As you go, why is the pressure going up? Because he's going down. Why is the pressure going up when he's going down? For the same reason that the pressure goes up when someone sits on top of me, right? Like yeah. So why is he inhaling the liquid? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Hand up in the back. Keep his lungs from collapsing. Great. Our lungs are filled with gas. Gases can can expand, but they can also be compressed. So it's the equal and opposite situation, right there. So um, I did. I mean, this I, this is exactly what I did with my AP Chemistry students a month ago when we did gas laws. Exactly. And the next thing I asked them. Just your eyes was this. I said, on the sheet of paper provided, demonstrate the relationship between gas pressure and gas volume. Um, and then there's a little, it says, insert a snapshot into your lab portfolio. So one of the, the things that was hard for me when I made a shift, and what I basically did when I switched from the pseudo teaching I was talking about to the real teaching, is I just took all my labs and I put them in the front. That was the first thing we did. So I just took all my chemistry labs, I removed as much instruction as I could, kept the guided stuff, and put them in the front. That was what I did, the that was last year. Put them all in the front. Um, and what I found out in doing this is when the lab becomes how you learn, not how you verify what you've learned kinesthetically, you know, when it becomes the actual learning experience, it's really hard, the tension between lab reporting it's complicated because I want the students to do this all the time, but I don't want them to be demotivated with a, with a complex lab write-up. So I had to come up with a way of just having a deliverable at the end and whiteboarding really worked well and I, I started um, just pushing out a blank Google template, a uh, Google Doc presentation and I don't know if you know this trick, but you can insert images as snapshots into a Google presentation. So I would have the students do their model on a piece of paper and then hold it up to the webcam and insert it as a snapshot it, right into the presentation. Then they would all analyze each other's models and I would have those. So let me show you some, some examples here. Um, so this was one group snapshot. They just wrote that on a piece of paper and they inserted it into the Google Slideshow using the snapshot feature. Okay. Um, so this was really cool. It showed, uh, they uh, obviously the arrow in their minds means pressure, and they're operationalizing volume here. I didn't ask them for anything more than a model like this. Um, this was one group that was really cool. Uh, we, we had a long conversation in a class about this, this, though, because you see there's more gas particles in the bottom one than the top one. So we talked about the idea of modeling the real world and how do we accurately create models to represent the real world if we're on our route to an equation. So, but they get the idea that the gas is expanding. Um, but the thing about this also, which is interesting, is those boxes aren't, are kind of the same volume. So this idea of gases filling their container was something that we talked about. But this one really fascinated me. I still look at this one, and I still don't know if I get it. But I, what I love is that they took this idea of a Venn diagram from their other classes, and they're talking somewhere about this overlap and I think that's where the pressure and I'm not really sure what's going on here but I w the one thing that did pop out at me was was that center part there's some deep thinking going on there I think uh, yeah but I, I honestly look at this over and over sometimes and I still don't even get what's going on but this part really popped out at me this part this group had prior knowledge I had not taught them PV equals NRT their middle school teacher or their science teacher must have taught them this equation so now, it's time for me to become more active as an instructor. If I jumped in and did initially, I do, we do, you do, about PV equals NRT, I would have had no idea about that group knowing it. We would not have had this need to know, because really their goal was to derive this equation out of this activity. And they went home you know, pissed off at me because I didn't tell them the equation. And then their homework it was to, to watch a video where I explained it to them. Okay? So it kind of, it, they're yearning for the tools rather than me saying to them, here's some tools. And some kids want them and some kids don't. So, so what I would do at this point right now is come in 
and deliver some lower end blooms taxonomy to them. And I, I, I call it kind of baby inquiry because I'm going to do direct instruction. I think direct instruction is great. I'm just going to do it later um, because I want them to have the opportunity to try and construct meaning on their own first. So I, I like to wrap it in, in a little package when you give kids a video to watch at home. Now this doesn't have to be a video. This can be reading or whatever. I mean, whatever you want. I like to make a video for the kids and I like to wrap it in a package. And I'm going to show you what that package looks like right now. So the first thing I like to do is I want to transfer to them the lower end blooms. So in this video that, I'll, that I made, I said pressure is this. Volume is this. Temperature is this. And I show images of their models and I comment on them to show them that I'm making this video in response to their misconceptions. I'm not giving them a stock Khan Academy video or giving them a video that I used the year before. I'm building off their misconceptions and the kids have really appreciated that. And then I say, and there's this equation called PV equals NRT that, that relates these two and I talk about the relationship between those. Okay. Um, in the video, I put some questions that I want them to reflect on when they're done watching it. Um, and the kids, after they do that, they then ask me questions about what they still don't get from the video. Right? So now we're taking a three minute video and we're turning it into ten minutes using some metacognitive reflecting like this. And then I tell them if they got it correct or not. Okay. And then I give them some feedback and we come into class the next day. And I feel, and I'm going to show you what this looks like. I feel like when you take an instructional video or, and you wrap the lower Bloom's taxonomy around this, it, it, it's much better than watching the hits on it to see if they watched it. So I'm going to show you what, what, this, what this looks like in a tangible way. Um, so I'm going to pull up my class website which is right here. It's musalemchemistry.com. You're more than welcome to you know, go there and spam me or something if you want. So um, here's our class website, and I'm going to show you the, the structure for it. So I'm using Weebly to make my class website. Weebly is like the best hidden secret in web design, I think. Um, it's unbelievable. So this is my class website, and there is lesson 10A. This is what they're watching right now. Now, I will warn you, this one is way longer. And it's longer because it's also accounting for what they're missing right now as I stand here in class. So I made this video to encompass what they were going to miss when I was gone today as well. So that's why. Um, so uh, this video is Lesson 10A on a very hard concept in chemical equilibrium that a lot of kids don't understand. Is this the first thing that they see about this concept? Absolutely not, right? They did a whole lab where they analyzed the difference between the Dead Sea and the Pacific Ocean and tried to reach the saturation of the Dead Sea and the Pacific Ocean in class to prove the density of the two, which defined what a saturated solution meant. And then they did this. So that was the, the switch there. So if you notice, though, below the video that they watch, I have a Google form embedded here. So what do you guys think MCQ stands for? Multiple choice question. Where is the question? It's in the video. So the video ends with a multiple choice question that they are to try and answer. Um, and I'll see if I can get to the end there in a sec. See if it's important because KSP does. So if you notice, what I have in here is a video taken from an old AP chemistry test just in the video. So I tell them to pause and answer the question. The thing is, they're not going to get to the question unless they watch the beginning of that movie. And the kids start to realize that they can fast forward to it, and it, which is totally fine. But the firewall of it being there is something I never even address. I just say at the end of it, there's a question. But it's so much easier for me because I don't have to write the question in the Google form. I can use the same form for every video. Right? So now this is something that people often don't do. But I tell you, in our world, I mean, I stock and I'm obsessed with Sir Ken Robinson. If he's here right now, I love you. Okay? However, however, I, I feel like we are all going to go back to our classrooms and I got to teach my kids to take an AP chemistry test. And we have the common core coming up. And I feel like that's the world that we live in. And I have these standards that I need to get my students to. And I feel like it's a cop out to say that we can't, and he, he didn't say anything bad. I feel like in general, the fact that they don't, they empower us because they give us direction for our learning cycles. I feel like we can do both, you know, but we have to ask kids questions like this. Like I want them to tell me how they solve the multiple choice question. I want them to think about it and tell me so I have information, 
I'm not grading this. I'm just getting information from them about how they think. What does FRQ stand for? Free response question. I want to know conceptually how they're able to work through this content. So that, here's the free response qu question. I want to know what they think conceptually. And a little rip off Dan Meyer right here. What's that stand for? What questions do you still have? They have to tell me if they have any questions still. I want to know what their misconceptions are. Now, three minute video. Do that 15 good solid minutes of homework, I feel like. Just quality solid minutes of homework. And the only rule I have, and they do about one of these a week, because we're couching it into this learning cycle. One of the rules I have is it needs to be submitted just a second before class on the day it's due. So what you see, and I'm lucky enough to teach at a school where my kids mainly have all access, right? So I try and leverage that. Um, and I'd probably try and get creative if they didn't. But looking at it through that lens, what I see is the kids all sitting in the hallway watching the video before they come into class, plugged in, filling out this form. It's freaking awesome because they come in and then we're like, let's apply that knowledge immediately. So they're rather than in the hallway copying off each other and then me giving them credit for that. So it's, it's kind of like the form is the most amazing. I love Google Forms. I mean, honestly, I, pff, ridiculous. So they fill all this out. But what do you think the students want to know after they filled it out? Did I get it right? Did I get it right? And I have sort of a really messed up obsessive compulsive grading policy in my class, which is 100% standards based. Like the only thing they get graded on are their quiz grades. So I want to know if they know it. But these things are their admission tickets into the quiz. So if they don't do the lessons, then I don't even let them quiz out on the standards. So it's just kind of like the culture of the class is this is how we learn. And they start changing. Now, I've messed around with a lot of different ways of giving them feedback to see if because I want them to know if they got it right. I don't want them to wait. Yeah? So I tried a lot of different things. I posted it on our website. I shot an email out to everybody. But the problem was it was always to everybody at one time. And about half those kids still hadn't watched the video yet. So I needed to have a way. And finally, a kid came up to this. A kid came up with this to me. It's amazing. She, I forget who it was. But she said, Mr. M, you know when it pops up and says, thank you for filling out this form? Why don't you just put the solution in there? Because we're not going to see it until we hit submit anyway. And I was like, genius. So it's so genius because the, it's locked into the same system that they filled out the question with. So when they hit submit now, the edit confirmation is all the solutions to it if this thing loads. So load, because this is a really good selling point. Like This is like the moment where you all go, oh. I miss one? No, because I, I always make choose one. That's just, Alice Killer showed me that. I just make choose one because they sometimes just leave it. Oh, come on, please. All right, I'm going to show you this because I just love it. It just, whatever, who cares? Let's just do it real quick again. All right, I'm going to go into the actual form. Boom. I'm going to show you in the form itself if it even opens up. My internet died. That's great. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm going to fill this out one more time because it looks really cool when it's actually in the website. But if you take anything from this and you're giving your kids videos to watch, leverage the edit confirmation. What? No, I know, but I'm etherneted in. I know. Okay, here's the, here it is. You can see it. This actually shows you in the old version of Google Forms how to uh, mess with your edit confirmation. So you see in here? These are, all, these are all links to the solutions to each video. So when the kids hit submit, that pops up. Now the really cool thing is if you put a link in there, it's live. It's a live link. So they can click right from the edit confirmation to it. And I'm using goo.gl. Have you guys shortened URLs before? 
Okay. I'm using goo.gl because it's tracking the hits. So if I have 100 kids watch a video and I only have 20 hits, they weren't that interested in that question. But if I have like 90 kids hit the solution video and they all got it right, good question, appropriate rigor, and it was interesting. Versus a question where there were two hits and everybody got it right. That's a, too easy of a question. So it gives me some, some, I never look at that, but theoretically, it gives me some, it gives me, it, it's like I can say that and I can know that I can go get that data. And Sometimes I'll look at that, but just to be real with you, this is a really easy way of doing it. Um, and what these are, are these are just little edu creations videos I made on my iPad of the solutions. So it's just a little iPad video, put it there, get the short URL, put in the edit confirmation, build it over the years so they have all of them there. Um, and the other little piece, uh, if you were at Catlin's session, she talked about this. But this is the form, this is where uh, everything goes that the students are filling out. Um, and if you notice, this is like a crazy big mess of nothingness. Um, this is like for the whole year. Like, look at all this stuff. Let's like, I mean, this is kind of funny if you read this stuff. I just, I, I love it. It's just so funny. But um, I'm going to show you guys, I'm going to just mention a little trick right now. If you guys use Google Forms, uh, I can't tell you how to do it right now, but I encourage you guys to learn about something called pivot tables. If you've never learned about what a pivot table is, um, I'm able to take all of this data in this sheet and consolidate it down in my spreadsheet into a very simple thing where I only see the stuff I want to see. Okay, so I can take this and I can say, dear pivot table, I only want to see their name and the lessons they did. That's it. And then when you make a pivot table and you tell the pivot table that, it ends up looking something like this. So now if you notice, this student right here, Brandon, has just done those four lessons. And I'm able to really quickly look at it. So I don't have to go through everything for the accountability piece. So that's a whole other spreadsheet session. But if you have that word written down right now, pivot table, I encourage you to look into that if you don't know that. Um, so the, the last little piece really is I want... I want the students to know I read their emails. I want to know that I was able to respond to their questions. And this was the piece that was the hardest for me as a teacher because I asked them questions and they all did their effort to do it and I wasn't replying to anybody because I have 100 kids, it would take forever. I was like, was I going to get an Edmodo or Schoology in reply or was I going to email each kid? So I came across this script in Google Spreadsheet called Form Emailer. And on Catlin's website, there's a tutorial on this. And my blog, there's actually a tutorial on this. I think my tutorial is what's on Catlin's site, but just saying. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Hashtag just saying. So um, it's, it's, it's called Form Emailer. And what it allows you to do is email the kids from the spreadsheet if you have their email address. So I, can, I sit there as they're walking into class, and I'm just shooting them emails from the spreadsheet. And it takes five minutes to respond to maybe 15 kids. Okay? And we'll do it right now in front of you, just so you see how quick it is. Like, here is an uh, email from... The kids just have to give you their email. So here's Cassandra's question, and she's my babysitter, so I'm going to give her a hard time. Okay, I'm kind of confused on how you explain Scott's Law. Don't really get it. Okay, so I'm going to just say, Cassandra... Um, how do you feel now about it? I saw you do it on the midterm last week. Just do liters, uh, moles divided by seconds to the order minus one. That sounds ridiculous. But then I go up here to form emailer and I go process manually and I look at what column she's in. So Cassandra is in column 209, row 209. So I just hit that. I press OK, and now she's getting an email from me right now. OK, there. She just received the email from me. So that's how quick it is. So I can go through, and this is good ed tech, I feel like, because I can respond to my students. And not only can I respond to them, it's building my awareness of their misconceptions. So when they come to class, I can be like, what? You think pressure and weight are the same? You ever stepped on someone's back with flippers on or high heels? Going to feel different, right? You know? And we can talk about that. So to show you what that looks like, I BCC'd myself on these emails. I should have received an email, and there it is. 
Um, this is the one I just sent from that spreadsheet. And um, in form emailer, you can set you can set up a little script in there where it tells you. So this is how like Barack Obama knows your name when you get an email. You know, um, hi Cassandra, your question. Kind of confused on how you explain that. My answer, and all I wrote in the spreadsheet was that stuff right there. That's all I wrote. So the thing is, like, Catelyn has it set up where her kids think they're getting like this essay from her, but all she did was do all of the um, things in the template before she went and said it. Um, so that might blow your mind. There's tutorials on how to do that on, on the, both of our websites. So, um, so the next thing, kids are going to come into class and we're going to go into applications of this. Um, so the first thing they're going to do is there's going to be an opener that's going to connect them to the lesson. So in this case it says, uh, at a constant temperature, which line best shows the relationship between volume of ideal gas and its pressure? Solve it real quick. You have 20 seconds. Go. What's the answer? B. They're inversely related. You guys told me that earlier. You said as it goes up, the pressure goes down, the volume goes up. So what that tells me, I might use Socrative, and what that would tell me is I'd get out this huge column with C, which is the misconception, which is the distractor. So we talk about why it's a distractor, and I do it again. And we keep doing it till the kids converge at the right answer. Okay? That's how we're going to start class that day. Okay, and then we're going to evaluate a new situation and try and extend it outward. So I'm going to show you this brief clip, um, and I want you guys to try and watch it. And there's another variable at work here. I want you to try and find the variable at work here. I'm from San Francisco, so we're into hipster coffee. So this is like a hipster coffee video. Here we go. <laughs> So the cool thing about this is siphon filter coffee, if you ever had it. The cool thing about this is, um, and I'm not going to ask you guys to deconstruct this right now because we need to get through it, but the cool thing about something like this is temperatures at work here, which is another variable that's important. And also, the volume of that container isn't changing. So all the kids think that all three variables are changing, but it's really a pressure temperature effect. So the kids, though, can create that new variable. I don't have to do another lesson on temperature. They have enough prior knowledge now, after watching the video, to add the other variable in. And invariably, no pun intended, they, um, I asked them to create a new model, and invariably most of the kids end up with something like this, which is the combined gas law equation, on their own. And they, if I just dig at them, and we spend a period doing that, that's a great way to spend a period. And by the way, that's something they can't do in a video at home. And a, one of my problems with a lot of long instructional videos is you're trying to do upper and lower blooms in the video. And I feel that the video, individual space, lower blooms. The community, higher blooms. Argue, debate, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, have, I want to leave you guys with like three things that I've learned in this journey um, and take it or leave it for whatever you want. One, it seems simple, but the questions before the answers. I think my tendency is what am I going to teach tomorrow? And teaching tomorrow means telling my kids how something works, letting them study what I told them, and testing them on what I told them. And then telling them how something works, letting them study how it works, and testing them on how it works. And there's, there's no ownership there, I feel like. So questions before answers. Um, have you guys seen this, this Dust Bowl Ken Burns thing? Okay. I was working with a teacher recently who wanted to teach the Dust Bowl, and he started off by having the kids watch this. And when we, when we figured out a better lesson, we started off the lesson by having the kids look at this, this graphic organizer, asking questions. What question comes to your mind when you look at this graphic organizer? What's the orange stuff, right? Well, let's throw on top of it some years. Okay. If you guys can't see the year... 1934. So what do you think the orange stuff is now? Yeah. So we can start, the kids can start building an idea about what that might have been, the economic impacts of it. 
then they do some horizontal alignment with their biology classes because it really has to do with soil and all this stuff. Um, so this is one quote that I really love. If you find yourself asking, am I really a writer? Am I really an artist? Chances are you are. The counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. So I think that I think that we need to keep reflecting. Like, I, I have this notepad that has a ridiculous amount of stuff written on it. Like, I want to learn from you guys about what works better. And I feel like the last year of my teaching career has been so much better when I just allowed myself to ask the kids if it worked or not anonymously. And when they really told me that and I had to own up to it, it forced me to change. Um, Two, embrace the mess of discovery. It sounds really idealistic, but sometimes it's hard to let go of the control. Um, but what's even harder is to design an environment where the discovery is actually harnessed and works. You know, and I'm not promoting give the kids a bunch of stuff and let them go. I think the art is what do we tell them and what do we not tell them, and when do we tell them it. Direct instruction is powerful. It's about when we do it. Okay. Um, I think this quote really sums that up really well. You guys know this comedian? Hilarious. Right? So, you know, I'm trying to raise my kids, and I have one guiding philosophy, which is this is just, it's an old saying that I renovated for my own purpose. It goes give a, give a man a fish, and you feed him for a day. Uh, teach a man a fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. Leave the dude alone, and he'll figure it out. What are you bothering people for? So I love that. And the last one I would say, and if, you, if you're in the document I gave you, you'll see to the right of this some links, um, is to plan intentionally. And when I say plan intentionally, meaning plan by delay, in your lesson plan, delay direct instruction. Plan intentionally. And I built some templates out that have some Bloom's words in there for you, and you guys can access that. I just stumbled across this amazing app called Common Curriculum that just came out. And it's a lesson planning app, but it's flexible. And it's all aligned with the Common Core. And you can move things around and everything. And it's so, honestly, it's really cool. So, um... And plan in the 80s. Okay, you heard Sir Ken Robinson talking about the ditto machines. What I mean by this is try and plan your lesson, and this is, I'm just sharing you with what I do. I try and plan my lesson as if I didn't really have any technology. No technology. And then assess it and say, what are my gaps? What do I suck at or what am I good at? And then figure out how technology can solve that problem for me. So then like revise in 2013. Because every teacher has a different strength and a different weakness. And I think technology can really help our weaknesses, but our strengths are, are, are things that are, are intrinsic to us. It's the art of what teaching is, I feel like. Um, and I love this quote, technology is only technology to those born before it. So our students don't think that any of this is cool, and, and we need to figure out how to get them to ask really good questions, and then we can guide them towards really real answers. But if we don't start with the questions first, um, the flip classroom is nothing more than uh, direct instruction that you saw in Ferris Bueller. So, um, those are my kids. So that's it. Um, thank you guys very much. Yeah. 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 <laughs>